Well, good morning. Good morning. Hope you all are doing well. Y'all doing well? Good. Good. Um, so, a lot of things going on in my mind. Um, if you're a guest with us, um, the type of preacher communicator I am is um, pretty, pretty direct, yet I kind of try to invite everyone into what's going on in my mind while I'm talking, which is a very, which is a very scary thing to do um, for both parties, but for, uh, for both of us. But um, one of the values that I have as a human being is to be a person that is committed to authenticity, which means just kind of showing you my heart. And when you do that, you're really trusting a group of people to not do something mean with your heart. Does that make sense? And so on, um, let me just invite you in on church stuff for a minute. Um, Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, those are the three biggies. So today's one of those, one of those big deals where people will come and they'll bring guests and so on and so forth. And if a person who does what I do is not careful, their number one objective will be to impress rather than serve. And so what I want to say first off is, um, I've put aside all desire to impress anyone in the room this morning and just endeavor to serve. Will that be okay? So that's going to be a little odd. Someone start to clap. Thank you. That really meant a lot to me. <laughs> and then it was over. And I said, like, you know, I, I mean, you can do it. I, I'll let you do it. But I don't necessarily, uh, yeah, we, we can do that. Um, so... I have a couple of weird ideas that have floated in my head, and I've been giving time and attention to this weekend for a while, um, and I'm not exactly sure how these things work, but um, this weekend I just kept on drawing a blank. I couldn't think of anything meaningful to say or do, like all week just trying to think, trying to think, trying to think, and didn't get anything. And so then, at about 7 a.m., which is really last minute notice for Jesus. Don't you think? Like, he could have been a little more on time than that. I had a handful of verses and a couple thoughts and ideas. And one of the ideas is my worst nightmare. This is a, I hope this isn't too much of a preamble. Hope you're not feeling any angst in all of this. But, 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 um, what, what I felt like I was supposed to do and we were supposed to do today is, and I told, I told Daniel right before the service that just heads up. What I'm about to do is my worst nightmare. And I want you to see the results of our Easter survey. If you could put that up on the screen, guys, if you have it, or gals. Um, this is the result of what everyone in our church asked about just a few weeks ago. And there was a lot on marriage, and there was a lot on parenting, and there was a lot on making a difference. So... This is what I think I want to do. It's not really what I want to do, but I think this is what we're supposed to do to serve you. I would like to see if there is anyone over the next few minutes or many someones who want to ask a question of me about marriage, parenting, or making a difference and at, let you ask the question and frame what we discuss for the remainder of our time this morning. So... Um, did you hear the crack in my voice? I'm really nervous. This is, this is my worst, I told you this is my worst nightmare. How many of you are glad you are me, you and not me this morning? Let me see your hands. All right, so, you, so if that's you, let me see your hands. If that's you, let me see your hands. Okay, um, every, uh, uh, ushers, did you see everyone who has their hand raised? Great, take the microphone to them. They're the first ones to ask a question. No, I'm teasing. If you wanna ask, if you wanna ask a question specifically about parenting, marriage or making a difference, I want us to take a few moments and just field those questions. If that's you, just raise your hand. If you're asking a question in the chat, someone on our media team will run the question to me. Anyone have any question that they want to ask on either or any of those subjects? It would make me happy if you all say no, but I really think that you all have some questions. And someone says, well, I feel like it's only a question that I would have. I promise you, someone else will benefit from your question if you have it. So who is it? Who's, who wants to start us off? Once it, once it starts, it'll be fun. Someone said, we'll start. Oh, all right. Good. They're afraid. They're afraid to ask. You're going to ask this on behalf of someone else? This group right here is afraid. Okay, oh, that's all right. I'm a pretty scary guy. <laughs> <laughs> what mic do they have? 
What mic is that? Mic five, Grant. There we go. So, marriage. Marriage. Keeping that together in today's time. The challenge of that. A couple of pastors, especially the folks that work. Oh, okay. Okay. Good question. In case the question wasn't audible to all, because I think we're having a little bit of issue with the mic. The question was marriage, um, especially in a two uh, income working home for younger people so that they can keep it together and remember their commitment of marriage. Is that a fair representation of the question? He said yes. Um, how many of you like that question? Okay, good question. I told you all you would ask a good question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read some Bible verses later. Um, baby, do you want to join me? It is, it's Mother's Day, but you don't have to. So like, I don't want to put pressure on you. This is all really impromptu, guys. Like, if you want to join us, join me, you can, but it is your day. Ladies and gentlemen, Angie Pennington. They'll get you one. They'll get you one. You look lovely. You're welcome. You smell good too. Hey, hey. We, we have four children, so, she, so we qualify for, as parents. We have four children. We had four by 24. We had four um, in 35 and a half months. So our, yeah, so some of the mom's eyes, because you all just intuitively did the math. Someone came up to me one year and they said, you must really love kids. And I said, no, I just really love my wife. Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's when my kids. Yeah, you're on. He, she's on. She's my three. That's when the kids do the eye roll. <laughs> yeah. But it's how they got here. So like, it's like a double-edged sword. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> did you want to answer? Did you want to start that? I guess for me, I just remember asking Josh, like, I just want to be on your team. And then I feel like teamwork is huge. Um, especially when you're both working, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week. Um, so I guess I would say teamwork and communication are what I would say is two huge pieces. Um, yeah. It's a good, you want me to go now? Yeah. My turn. I want to go a little bit deeper and go below the surface a little bit. And I, I want to, I'm going to, I don't know if I'll do this with every question, but I'm going to do this with this question. I'm going to, I'm going to try to answer with, um, the, the, the wife, the mom in mind. Here's why. Um, because I, I have this belief through conversations, through communication with my wife and I, that um, it became clear to me through conversations that I was oblivious to how many changes and sacrifices my wife made over the many years of raising children and being a spouse and us being a spouse together. And, and um, what that means to me is this, that if you if you think about it, all of the changes and sacrifices that a woman makes that a man never has to start off by, you go from a pre-mom physical body to a while you're growing the child mom physical body to a post-mom post-birth physical body then to the process of not being able to be a mom anymore in the physical body. And oh, by the way, not just the body, but the mind issues of my child needs 24 seven care that I am their complete and total supply. A mom is in many ways. Uh, they don't get the break. Then from that to taking kids to, and I know I'm generalizing, but I'm championing the moms and the ladies who this has been your story and no one's verbalized this. Then you're going from all of the ball games and traveling them to and from the practices. And then you go from that to they need less and less management, the kids I'm speaking about, to then they need no, they need no management at all. And something that I'm concerned about that churches don't talk about is the changing in identity that mothers go through and that women go through in their journey of life. And that it takes a, a man to maybe speak to a man in the room to say, your wife has changed and sacrificed way more than you have. Um, 
that is not to diminish the role of a man in the relationship, but it's, it's, it's not the same. All the while, while I'm getting up, getting ready, getting in the car, going to my office, doing my thing, my wife and the mom is doing this great big changing arc of thing, and then, and then, and then I wonder what's so difficult. I'm answer, say it again. Somebody say something to me. Oh, sorry. So, so I'm saying that to say on this Mother's Day, I think one of the things that I would like every young husband to know is that your wife and, and that mom is doing a lot more than she's ever telling you she's doing. And that the change is really, really challenging. And so make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, the earlier, the better. I would also say from a husband's perspective that some men need to write this down. I didn't see any man move. Some men... <laughs> It wasn't a, so men need to write down what I'm about to say. That mom, that wife, she never clocks out. Never say, I just need to clock out. And never mentally clock out. When you come home, don't just throw yourself on the couch and turn on the TV. Give your wife a hug and a kiss and ask her if there's something that you can do to help give her a bit of a respite for 30 minutes before you decide to clock out because she will not remind you because she's too nice that she doesn't get to clock in and clock out. So be aware to ask your wife what she needs before you do anything when you come home. It's a good question. I, I think we could go longer and further, but I think there were other hands who had questions. So the other thing I would just add is sometimes I feel like as, as women, we assume that our significant other can read our mind. <laughs> say it again, maybe say it again. <laughs> so I guess I just would encourage you just like speak up and just say, Hey, this was a challenging morning. You know, everybody was giving me attitude. You know, we had four teenagers at once, so everybody was giving me attitude. And so I'm not trying to tell a sad story, but it was a rough morning. So please be understanding with me or, you know, whatever the situation is, if you're not feeling good um, or you didn't sleep good the night before. Um, I think sometimes we just assume that our spouse knows these things. Um, I said something yesterday and he's like, oh, I didn't know that. So that makes, you know, we're more understanding of one another when there's context to go along with how your day went or how you're feeling physically or emotionally or whatever. So, um, yeah. One of the exercises we do along that line is um, when things get really heated in our marriage, um, one of us will tr one of us will be more level-headed than the other. Have you noticed that? That in any relationship and it gets really intense and intensifies, someone seems to be able to keep their head above the logical water threshold. And whichever one of that is, we'll help each other with this little exercise and we'll either ask the question or we'll say. So for example, it's really intense and for whatever reason, I'm the one that was hurt by it. I and I can keep my wits about me and don't just go off, which happens. Um, I'll say this, baby, this is the story I'm telling myself in my head. And I'll fill in the blank. The story I'm telling myself is that you didn't appreciate what I did or that you're treating me like a, one of the kids. You've under, whatever, whatever that negative thing might be. And then we have that point of communication where we're able to maybe filter through that and, and process through that a little bit better, right? Yeah. yeah. Who else had a question? Yes? Oh, oh number four. There's a question that came in from oh. our Facebook feed, Pastor oh, Josh. Sweet. Um, this is Mary on Facebook. She says, what would be the best way to get involved if you've only been an online attendee, but have been attending online for a while, six plus months? Will you read it for me again, please? Sure. What would be the best way to get involved if you've only been an online attendee, 
but you've been attending online for six plus months? It's a good question, Mary. I think one of the things is if there's a, if, so remember I've told you over and over that people who are on the other end of that lens, they're real. This is an example of that. What, first thing I would say, Mary, is thank you for watching online and thank you for engaging and, and thank you for being a part of our online community for sure. And um, second, I would say if there's a reason, uh, maybe distance, uh, maybe uh, physical limitation or some limitation why you can't be here, uh, what I would like for you to consider in, I think this is kind of a making a difference type question. It was the one of the three categories. Uh, what I would like for you to consider is um, being committed to being an online moderator. And what I would like is someone on the media team to reach out to you and have a conversation to where you can help facilitate conversations that are going on in our online community in that thread. I think that's an excellent way for you to be involved if online is the only way for you to, to currently worship with us. If being here in person is an option, I would encourage that because then the, the options are, are wide open. Um, the second thing is, is that we have people who are on a prayer team, which is, is doesn't have to happen in a specific place or certain time. And so you could certainly be a part of our prayer team as well. I would say those are two good ways. A third one um, would be to be generous in resources, uh, because the media outlet in which you're receiving from, the church does invest resources to get this message out. So I would say online moderator, prayer person, or person of generosity, if you're unable to be here, those would be my, those would be my three quick answers to that, to that really good question. So thanks, Mary, for the question. Anyone in the room? Parenting, marriage, making a difference? Yeah, one more, another one? Okay, very good. Um, obviously, we only have a one-year-old, but when you guys raised kids, can you give advice on not only how to raise them in Christ, but for them to encourage them to find their own path with Christ? Sure. Good question. Want to go first? <laughs> no? Are you sure? Um, the, the first thing I would say, your, your child is one. It probably hasn't happened yet. Um, but when they become old enough, and a parent is, I think, the foremost authority on when they're old enough to understand yes and no, when they are choosing to do something that they're not supposed to do, that's when we've always believed in the value of consistency and not giving in to their energy. Because I, I think you've already realized this as a mom of a one-year-old, they have way more energy than you and they will wear you down. Um, and so consistency matters. And, and the, the, the way that we think through on consistency is this, and then helping that child find their path toward God. Um, never do your best to limit the amount of times in which your disagreements with your child are your will against theirs. Because I said so, I think is an awful answer. I think it's a terrible answer. I think we can do better than that. And I, and I think what we can do is we can help that child know that this is not about mom and dad's way versus their way. It's about that we believe that God in heaven has a will and a plan for each of our lives. And my job as a parent is to help my child find that plan. So it isn't my way against your way. It's both of us trying to work together to find God's way. Now that obviously becomes easier as they age, but the consistency and the early years will allow you to lean into that. Meaning don't make threats bigger than you can fulfill. Does everybody know what I mean by that? For example, you have a teenager. If you ever do that again, I'm taking your phone away for the rest of your life. No, you're not. You're not going to do that. So don't say that you're going to do that. Whatever you say, make sure you can back it up with action. Does that make sense? The, the second thing I would say is, I, you're probably gonna interpret this through a, 
a biased lens and everyone in the room may think that I'm biased. I probably am, but I believe in the power of a local church. Uh, I'm going to say something unpopular. Uh, don't elevate sports above their relationship with Jesus. Um, your child and their athletic ability is not a retirement plan. Um, it boggles the mind. I'm not going to get into it because you're here and I'm not going to talk about the things that aren't applicable. But as we've gone on in the last nearly 20 years, the increase of not just sports, but just extracurricular activities that eat in. If you do that, I love you. God loves you. But let me talk straight to you. If you don't prioritize your child's spiritual life, don't wonder why they're not walking God's path. Is that fair? I mean, if you don't prioritize Jesus and you prioritize soccer, don't be confused why they love soccer more than Jesus. Don't wonder why, they lo why we live in Valley. Don't wonder why they love football more than Jesus. It's not rocket science, y'all. It's like, oh, how did all this happen? You know how it happened. You're just in denial about it happened, how it happened, because you're abdicating responsibility and expecting then someone else to do the heavy lifting on that child's spiritual growth, but you spent more time kicking and throwing a football than you did praying and encouraging them to read the word and seeking God. And you're like, oh, how did it happen? You know how it happened. Don't play dumb. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming to Mother's Day. Like, I mean, don't we need people who will love, am I against sports? No, our kids did it. But there was no mistake what was the priority. God, family, his house, everything else. Let me go over that real slow one more time. God, family, his house, and then everything else. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. It's a challenge. And let me go back to why... This is more than what you've asked for. Should I quit? Did I, go, did I say too much? I, are you sure? Here's, here's the challenge. Every parent messes up their kids sooner rather than later. Not on purpose. It just happens. But watch this. Do not let your need for ego and identity live vicariously through the next generation and rob them of a spiritual blessing because you want them to be a this, a that, or the other. Your number one responsibility as a believer is to make sure that your child is raised knowing who God is and how he works, not whether or not he can throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. But dad wants him to throw, you can clap it just a second. Dad wants him to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. And so dad refuses to have Jesus be his identity and instead goes for his son to be his identity because then he can stand up and say, that was my son who struck that person out rather than being able to say, my identity rests in what Jesus and what Jesus alone did for me. And I'm gonna love my kid no matter how he excels or doesn't excel or how she excels or doesn't excel. I don't care if she, they have two left feet and they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. That has no bearing on my identity. My identity is rested firmly and squarely in what Jesus has done for me. And I don't need my child to prop up my ego. One of the things I would say too, is just be kind of on the lookout um, with our four kids. I, one of my things I always say is when people say boys and girls are so different, I will say, yes, that's true. But my boys are so different from one another and my girls are so different from one another, like very, very different from one another. And my son's shaking his head. Yes. So just kind of be on the lookout for what kind of lights that child up when they're in their, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, years. Um, my one son, I could, it was pretty obvious. He probably wasn't going to go to a four year school and that's okay. Um, so just kind of encourage what you're naturally seeing for them. Um, we had one child that kind of was floundering at a certain point that we're like, okay, they need to kind of be figuring out what's, what's next. And so we sat down and said, Hey, what about this? You know, just kind of gave them some of the things that we saw. Um, so I think, I think just recognizing that, you know, if, if you have more than one, that they are going to be different um, and, and sometimes quite a bit different and accepting that and, and just kind of helping them walk that journey of, of figuring, you know, some of their steps out. I want to say, add something to that on the parenting thing. Um, 
moms realize that you being a mom is not all that that child needs. And dads, remember that you being a dad is not all that that, that child needs. And that's easier said than done. It's so much easier. There were some times where that child right there on the front row, that's the male. Him and I were like this. My wife just said, oh gosh, am I telling the truth, Jake? And it was just, um, he was growing his horns. Mine were, all, mine were already established. And it was like, it, it, was a, it was a play for dominance. And there were times where Ange was like really nervous and some stuff that he was doing, I had to be like, hey, step out of the way here. I got, I got, I'm, I'm gonna handle this. And she, would, and she would like resist and be like, no, he's my baby boy. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about anything except godly, fatherly parenting, but knew that what the mom, the female was going to bring to the equation is not what the young man needed at the time. Okay. Well, and I would say too, I know there was more than one occasion where you could tell that my girls yes. were upset. Thank you. Um, and I guess I would encourage, um, Let's see. Let me finish that first, though. Um, and I remember going to Josh and saying, okay, I think your daughter's upset, but I can't talk to her. You upset her, and you need to talk to her. Um, because sometimes they can be clueless, and so you just kind of need to, like, clue them in. Hey, you know, you need to have a chat with your daughter because she's upset. Well, we but, have two, so I'd be like, well, which one? <laughs> and what's her problem? And how do I fix it? And I'll go tell them right now. And she's like, no. She just wants you to listen to how you hurt her feelings. I'm like, I don't want to do all that bull crap. She can write it in a journal. She can go to a therapist. I don't want to do that. Yeah. But the other thing is, we watched, we watched a family member. Somebody was going to clap back there. Where's the dad clap? Yeah. No, 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 don't clap at that. Don't clap that. We watched a family member um, after they had passed away. The relationship, um, it, was, it was a mom. Once the mom had passed away, the the daughter did not have a relationship with her father. And I feel like sometimes as moms, we can be a bridge and that's okay. But if that bridge collapses, then there's no relationship between these two individuals. So I guess I would encourage dads to have a relationship with your daughters and dads to have a relationship with your sons, moms to have, you know, vice versa. Um, because that was devastating to see that. Um, but the mom was always the bridge instead of saying, hey, you know, you need to go talk to dad and ask him for permission the mom would always get the permission and then go to the daughter does that make sense mm -hmm. is that confusing so anybody else have any questions one more question two more questions anybody anybody another one online sweet i really like you online today thank you uh, Pastor Josh, this is from Morgan on Facebook. Okay. What do you do when you have two children and one is very active in the church and desires it and the other one wants nothing to do with it and says, we make her go against her will? Um, an age would be helpful for me. I'm guessing like they're, they're in the home age. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question assuming that they're young. Is that, is that Okay. Yeah. Do you want to go first? I, I guess we always just said if they were if they were living in our home, so if if we were paying the mortgage that they were responsible for coming to church, that was just kind of our hard line. Yep. We didn't. Oh, we do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> so. So like in our home, it wasn't like really authoritative. We didn't do a lot of drama over it. It was just built in and we did it. And so I'm gonna go back to the consistency thing. Um, I'm not saying this in your case, cause I don't know, but a parent's consistency will lead the way. And so if the child doesn't know, are we or aren't we doing it from week to week, then it leaves room for them to say, well, what are we doing? Or if it seems negotiable to the parent, then certainly it's going to seem negotiable to the child. And so if consistency, and if it's built in as a value, the less you get, are we going? Do we have to go kind of thing for us? Even before we were pastoring a church, 
we, we just went to church and, and our kids went with us. And I don't really ever remember very many times where do I have to go today was an issue. Um, and so it was, it was more of a, this is what we're doing. And as long as, as Ange said, as long as you're in our home, this is what we do on Sunday. And oh, by the way, we'll tell you, this is something that I saw my parents do, Angie's parents did, we did. The church has evolved and changed, and I think for the better in a lot of ways. But I would say that committing, committing to church in 2024 is a lot different than it was in 1994 or 2004. But because in those days you had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and every other month there was revival, which was Sunday night through Friday night or Sunday to Sunday, sometimes morning and afternoon. And so like there was a lot of taxation on family's time. Maybe that's bit us in the rear end because we've, well, I don't want to go down that path, but I would say that the bar is pretty manageable. And to say, I, said, I guess to be consistent, bring the child, if they're a child, um, even if they're a teenager, to me, they're still a child. They're benefiting from your kindness of bed, pillow, food, clothing, shelter. It's a small exchange. And let them know, hey, we're going to have a good attitude about this. We're not going to have a bad attitude about it. The other thing I was going to say is we have so many of our 12 to 18-year-olds that are on our uh, dream teams. And I think for them to get involved and feel like that they're making a difference. Um, we have one of our seniors that's graduating, and I don't know the, the exact number, but I think, I think literally she's been serving in the nursery since she was in 11 or 12. Um, so I think for them to even get involved, um, I think that would be something that might be a help to them. Mm -hmm. Good. We're out of time unless someone has one more question. Oh, yes, ma'am, right here in front. Hold on just a second, wait for the mic so everybody can hear. And online too. As far as bringing the children to church, what mm -hmm. happens if the daddy does not come to church, the mom comes to church, and the, son, the kids say, no, I don't want to go to church, and the dad says, okay, don't go to church? Then your assignment at that point, I would say, is to pray or choose war. Do you want to die on that hill or not? I don't know. Um, it's hard to do things when you're undermined by someone of equal authority. Uh, depends on how much energy you have. Um, in my experience, most moms win that war because they're like, no, I'm bringing them with me. Um, if it's a divorce situation and a, a custody issue, that's a whole layer of complexity that I don't really know in the next few minutes I would do well answering because there's too many layers to it. But um, if, if there is something underlying like that, that makes it impossible, then I believe that parent should have the, the priority of praying. And the prayer would be, soften my children's father's heart. And I'd stay on that. And I'd pray about that. And I'd stick with it. And believe that that turns. Anything else you want to add? Thank you for the question. How has Josh made a difference in your marriage? I love that question so much. You, you, have, no, you have no idea how much I love. Thank you for asking that question. I've been wanting her to answer that for many, many years. This was Mother's now. Day. <laughs> Woo! This is going to be the best day of my life. Come on, baby. Just, just let the people know what they want to know. <laughs> well, initially, I thought I couldn't start talking without crying, so we'll see about that part. Um, but one of the things we talked about in the first service is just the importance of, of knowing when kiddos need the, the strong voice to come in and when they need more of an emotional support. Um, so I, I know Josh can probably elaborate a little bit more 
on what we said earlier. Um, but sometimes as just, a mom... This is maybe to bring you back to the question, which was... I just, I just said... How much of a difference and how have I made a difference in your life? I'll, I'll, I'll flip the question. So, so the other day he asked me, he said, where, where do you think you would be if it wasn't for me? And I was like, whoa, that's pretty bold. I was like, probably in a van down by the river. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. But truly, truly... Um, it, I guess I feel like it's God's best to, to um, co-parent, and I know that doesn't work out in the same way for every family, um, so I guess I would encourage you, um, if, if that is a struggle, if you're not with the, the parent to your children, to pray for them, because um, sometimes it's hard to be upset with somebody when you're also praying for them, um, but yeah. On the... Thank you, different there, sir. But I want to piggyback off, and, and what, what we don't want, here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to repeat what happened and try to recall what we said in the first service in the 9 a.m. for the 11 a.m. because who's in the room matters. And so I want to answer the specific questions that we have here, not try to revert back to that because I think there's life and just answering what's in the room. I think that one of the ways in which we've tried to make a difference in each other's lives is um, by honoring each other's gifts and recognizing the different gifts that each of us has. There are certain things that she sees that really, if, until, I, until I acknowledge them as a gift, then they become a weapon against me. And I, I think she's trying to hurt me. Because there's, um, you, if you're taking notes, it might be worth writing this down. Um, all miscommunication starts with differing assumptions. That's how it all starts. And so I think she's trying to undermine me or tell me she's better at it when really there's really nothing in that in her, she's just trying to make me better because of the way God has made her, and I'm trying to make her better because of the way God has made me. Everyone, whether it's a husband and wife or a friend, everyone needs a relationship that the proverb writer calls ironing, iron sharpening iron, someone making you better. I was going to say, in those times, that can sometimes be uncomfortable. What I mean... It's, there's a lot of sparks that fly when iron is sharpening iron. And the same is true relationally, but someone, what does that mean? Everyone needs a friend who can get in your stuff. Yeah. And watch this. If you don't have that, if you don't have that, you're in dangerous territory. If, if there isn't someone in your life that can say, no, stop that. As an adult to an adult, not speaking down to you. No, stop that. That's really dumb. You're living at a disadvantage. I can remember a time specifically when I was having one of those days where I was just like, I suck at everything. I'm a horrible mom. I'm a horrible cook. I'm a horrible housekeeper. I'm a horrible mom. And I understand that. I was, I was really horrible momming, I guess. But Josh looked at me and he said, would you just please stop? And he was kind of strong with me. And I was like, I was wanting to have like a pity party for myself. And he wasn't coming to the party. <laughs> Um, so that was kind of upsetting, but I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, this is just the emotions I'm feeling for the moment, but these aren't true things. Um, and I think, I think that the enemy sometimes will want to get in and say that you are horrible about all those things. You're horrible a as a mom and a wife and a coworker, sister, all those things. Um, and those are, you know, obviously there's all, always places that we can work and get better, but some of us, I think the enemy just wants to get in there and just tell us all this crap that's not true. The thing that really, so when she was saying it that day, um, one thing I have had to learn to give language to is I'm not coming at you. I'm coming at the thing that's coming at you. Because she was, she was believing and reciting things about her that were not true in that moment. And she needed a friend in the form of me that would say, whoa, 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 that is not true. Stop saying that about yourself in a way that didn't speak down to her, but that called her up and reminded her, oh, wait a minute, that isn't correct, what I'm saying. And she said vice versa, the similar things back to me that just have absolutely made a difference in our life. She alluded to being strong to the, our sons when they did they needed someone with strength. And uh, moms, dads, if you're together or not, but if you are, moms, it's, my, it's your day, so let me help you. 
let that trusted male speak into your son's life in a way that only a father, father figure can, which will make you very uncomfortable. There were times where I would hear my sons do things toward their mom, my wife, and I would say, get out of the way. I'm going to take care of this kid right now. Like not as a threat, but as like, watch, like as a covering for her to protect her from having to carry something that she wasn't wired to do. She's wired to do a lot and that's enough, but I cannot abdicate responsibility by not speaking strength to my sons to back them down when they're being disrespectful in our home or to do things that need to be corrected with fatherly language. Let me just say it while I'm at it. Fatherly correction is not toxic masculinity. It's biblical and godly and needed. And also I would say um, with our daughters, there's been times that I've seen that they were hurting and I would, I would say to Josh, hey, I think your daughter is hurting. You need to go and talk to her. And I knew it was something that I couldn't do, but he needed clued into that there was emotions that, that they were dealing with that he needed to, that he could address. Um, so. I was just oblivious. Yeah. I've taught my daughters this principle since that they were old enough to understand. And it's a very, it's very good advice for all women until it's not, which is this boys are dumb. <laughs> How do you know when they stop being boys? is the next question. When they begin to accept, no, you can know. Uh, you can know, and I'll help you. Uh, when they begin to take grown-up responsibility and, and accountability for their actions. And until then, they are dumb. So if you're single and looking, they gotta prove their intelligence. You need to, you need to see their tax return. I'm dead serious. When, when a boy comes to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage, they're going to bring a tax return. Not for the reason you might think. I don't care how much they make. Did they do their due diligence and responsibility by filing and doing something that you're supposed to do as a grown-up adult? The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean my gun while I'm talking to them. That thing, that is, that is... Because I live in Licking Valley, and uh, I'm a red-blooded, God-fearing, gun-toting American, and I'm, and I'm okay with a little fear when you're about to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage. It's probably why they're both single. They're probably, I'm, I'm probably the problem, but I'm okay with that. Um, any, uh, good on that one. Anybody else? Have, who else has a question? There's some here. Oh, y'all are, are popping. The first service like pulling teeth. Good. Um, they were still asleep and saying it's probably true. This is regarding making a difference. I don't like the way the world's been going, and I want to know how to make a difference at the grocery store and driving my car and, and just in everyday life. How did the Lord lead you by his spirit to, to be sensitive so that he could elevate you to the level of a pastorship and teach about making differences? It's a very good question. It's very kind of you to say it that way too. Do you want to go? It's, it's funny you said driving your car. I, um, I just had the idea to bring some um, meat out of my freezer to a family. And so I put it in the cooler and dropped it off and the point is, I wouldn't have went down this street typically on my on my current path. Um, so it was saying yes to packing up the cooler, getting the meat out, the whole nine. Um, so I dropped the meat off, and I was like, should I go that way or that way to get to my next stop? Um, and I saw this lady taking a picture outside of this house. Well, it was the house that he had lived in um, with his dad. And I had known that it had went up for sale. So I was like, oh, that's cool. That's, I think this is probably the new owner. So I rolled down my window and I was like, hey, are you the new, you know, are you the new owners? So I guess just to answer your question, I feel like it's just those little promptings that I have. Because sometimes you're like, is it the Holy Spirit or is it me? 
And I, I invited these, I don't know if they're here today or not, but I invited this, this um, mom and her daughter to church. So I guess just following those little promptings, and it can be kind of, I think it can be kind of fun. It's scary at first, but I think once you start doing it, um, and it's amazing how it makes you feel because um, they were new to the community. And of course, I welcome to the community and stuff. It, it was just too far away from you. If you're moving, it was drifting. It was so anyhow, I, I guess that's what I would just say is I feel like there's just little promptings that, you know, why did I decide to bring, you know, the, the freezer meat to this couple? And, you know, so just following those little paths that the Lord takes you on on the daily basis um, I want to be add, very rewarding. I want to add to that. Um, Always be aware of the broken heart of humanity. Yeah. Always be aware that people around you are broken and that they're empty. And I've said this, and it bears repeating, that it is not, our, it is not your job, it is not my job, it is not our job to fill anyone else's cup. It's our job to empty ours that day. So keep that in full view as often as you can. Have I emptied my cup? Like, which is just a metaphor of, have I done everything I know to do? Have I taken the steps? Do, do I have a clear conscience? Do I feel like I did the things that I knew to do, not what I didn't know to do, to make a difference? And the way I've built that is really, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, the last couple of weeks have been pivotal conversations from God's word about understanding who God is and how he works through us. And we started looking at 1 John 2.20, which says, you have an anointing in you. You have a power in you. Every believer has this power. And it's worth following him and his power so the, the same way that I've been talking to us as a church about that, that's the same way I knew to do what I'm doing right here this moment today about Q&A. Right. Yeah. If you were here in the second service last weekend, it was the same way I knew to act on the two individuals that I asked to come help Daniel sing. There was something on the inside that said, this seems like it would be a good idea to God. So let's do that. And the same with the Q&A. It wasn't a good idea to me. So we could forget about the idea of being me because I didn't want to do that. Or it wasn't really in my consciousness. Um, I, think we can, I, I think we can effectively, after two questions, rule out the devil because the devil doesn't want churches talking about things that people are interested in. Right? He wants us talking about the things that hit us right where, right where we are. And so just make it a practice and just continue to build on it every, every day. And I think, I think you're probably also um, making a larger difference in more people's lives than you're already conscious of. And I would say that to everyone, which isn't, a, which isn't, a, which isn't an excuse to pause and stop, but it also can fuel you to look back on the past and say, oh, I followed this idea and this person was helped and to not think that I'm not a difference maker. Begin to think of yourself as a difference maker because that's what God calls us. We're to be salt and light. What do salt and light do? Salt makes things brighter. Salt, excuse me, light makes things better and salt makes things, you know what I'm saying, better and brighter. Yep, better and brighter. This is unscripted and I haven't written it down and memorized it, okay? Salt and light make things better and brighter. That's what we're called to do. There was one Yep, there was one, another one. There was one down here too. I don't want to, I don't want to miss. Go ahead. Uh, Pastor Josh, this came in from Kim from Facebook. She okay. asked, any advice for Christians who are married to an unbeliever? You want to go? <laughs> you probably feel like that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, pray. Prayer, prayer is pow powerful. Um, I guess being sensitive to, to where they are and maybe not expecting them to take one giant leap, but seeing those little steps that they are taking closer and closer to Christ. Um, patience. Those are good. Those are the things that come to my mind. Um, I would say to you, Kim, and anyone else who is dealing with that, don't take on the role of the Savior. We're to be Jesus' image in the earth, but we're not him. And it can be so tempting to, to put so much pressure on us that in, in, in doing that and taking our assignment so seriously and having that deep love for them, 
that we actually become weird and unhelpful by putting too much pressure, by dropping hints, by maybe doing something that would appear to be nagging or just relentless. Uh, part of what faith means is that we trust God, we do our part, but at the end of the day, Kim, our Bible says this, that no one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws them. So if we have any effectiveness in this life, it's because we let God do his work. So I would probably pre pray more and talk less to them in any kind of way that is in your mind trying to move them in a direction. Just let God do it and he will do it. And everything, building that on what Ange said as well. That would be my that would be my suggestion to you. There was one right here. We are um, we're a blended family. Um, we got married. All of our children were raised. My question is about parenting. How do you draw those children? Your they're your heart. They're your soul. They were raised in church. Between the two of us, we have seven. And how do you draw them back to God without, you know, smacking them in the face with your Bible? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have, uh, I have one who at 25 had a heart attack. She has a pacemaker. You know, she was raised in church. She was hurt by a church. So how do I, how do I show her that all churches are not like that? You know, how, how do we draw all seven of those little monsters back to where they belong? Can you tell me an age range, please? Is that too intrusive? <laughs> oh, no. The kids range from 34 down to, how old is Grace? 27. 27. So all adult children? All adult children. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> to, me, to me, I would probably answer how we did before if it's a spouse. You know, um, praying for them and being patient and showing them God's love. And, um, yeah, I, I would, I would add this would, this would apply to this question and to, the, to a lot of questions, right? Um, a lot of the types of questions that have to do with making a difference and influencing the first person that you have to lead is you. So are you clear? This is rhetorical. Uh, are you clear that you're living out all of the values that you want them to see? And then once you are, you just keep and, t and stay that course and know that I'm doing what I know to do. I've sown every seed. Remember the Bible says this, some planted, Paul, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God makes it grow. I used to lament over the growth of our church. Like, what, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And Jesus gently reminded me that it is his job because he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. We get into trouble whenever we try to do God's part. And if we do our part, which I know you well, each of you well enough to know that you're, you're probably doing much, much better than you realize and that your life is speaking much louder than they're responding. But I would just say, keep on living the way you know is right to live. Keep praying for them. And I would specifically remind yourself of the verse when God says, you train up a child in the way they should go, they won't depart from it. And stand on the idea that every day, God is bringing prodigals home. Yeah. And he can heal the wound. You can't. I always um, pray too that that God would send people across my loved one's path who may not know him, that would speak life to them. But also in turn, then I know I have to be willing to step out and do that because I can do that for someone else's loved one. And someone else may have a voice in your child's voice in your child's life that you may not be able to have. And some of you maybe heard, heard me told the story when we were on vacation and we had a stranger flag us down on the beach to tell something to my daughter. So, you know, just being willing to be that voice for someone else's child and believe God that people will be sent across your kid's path. It's also good to remember 
that whomever we're talking about that we want to make a difference in their life, whether it's our, our children, a spouse, a coworker, a friend, no one, no one loves them more than God loves them. Let me just say it a little more plainly. You do not love your children more than God loves your children. Sometimes it's a matter of trust on that, that when push comes to shove, we believe we love them more than God loves them. And we have to bring our mind back to, wow, Lord, if I'm this concerned and this has mu this much of my attention, how much of your attention does it have? And it brings me comfort to know help is on the way and God is working even when I don't see it. Anybody else have a question? Some others I thought I saw hands elsewhere. Yep, there's here, there's in the back. There might've been some over there. Uh, I premise uh, what I have to say. My wife here is here and I enjoyed our 70th wedding anniversary last week. Seven, wait, 70th? Woo! But I want to uh, maybe tell some of the guys in this room that uh, it isn't that hard. Of course, you have to live a little longer to, you know, to do that. But it, it, it isn't just listen to God and do what's right. Why can't they all do that? So I think we should switch places. <laughs> It's a wonderful testimony. Please tell us your, your names. Hugh Heinemann. Hugh and your wife? My wife's Kitty. Kitty? Yes. Thank you for 70 years of faithful marriage and display of God's grace on your life. Thank you. We honor you both on Mother's Day. That's amazing. Yes. I was a young person. There was, a, there was one here. There was one over here. Right in the front. So I have a question for uh, uh, pretty much just advice for anyone who's starting out their faith later in life with children and uh, their children have grown a bit more and you're introducing something they've never known, God, into their life. I see a lot of people that we've baptized are various ages and uh, a lot of them do have children. Some of them you'll see the children yelling, yay, daddy, in the background. Uh, but uh, it's kind of hard to know where you're going with that. Good question. Or, uh, you feel good like question. you have nowhere to stand on. Yeah. Good. My, 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 uh, I'll elaborate so this isn't sarcasm. Okay. I'll, well, you should start at the beginning. And some practical ways of what that means to me is no matter where they are in their age, you start as if it's the beginning for them because it is. There's a spiritual law that describes their development as spiritual babes. And the beginning of what does a baby crave in the beginning of their life? Milk. As they age, they get an appetite for different things. Um, I'm trying to see who would have an infant. She has her twins today. Who has her twins? Oh, okay, I'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> Nathan, how old is the baby next to you? four months. Tell everyone the baby's name. Nora. Nora's four months. Be unwise for me to deliver to Nora a medium rare 45 day dry aged bone in ribeye from Ruth's Chris. <laughs> Some of you are Googling, what does that mean? <laughs> It'd be unwise for me to give her steak, right? Why? Why would it be unwise for me to give Nora steak? Why do you think that would be a bad idea, Caleb? She's not ready. She can't chew it. You start with what they can process. And for me, I think a beautiful new beginning for any believer is reading the gospel of John. It's called the gospel of belief. It shows you a different angle of who Jesus is. And if you would begin to read that, depending on the age of these children, you'll find that as you age, 
You never age out of knowing more about who God is. So it's amazing that this book has the power and capacity to raise up and teach a four-month-old in Christ and a 40-year-old in Christ, all with the same words, based on the power of the Holy Spirit who's pulling out of those words the thing that that stage of life needs. In fact, it's a miracle every Sunday when anyone stands on this platform and shares something and that people from all ages, both chronologically physical age and spiritual age can glean something from it. And the only way that can happen is because God sent his son, raised him from the dead, and he sent back the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has his stuff and he's our teacher, he's our leader, He's our guide. So my simple instruction would be start with John chapter one and read it and just go as far as they can. A second book that I would recommend is the book of Proverbs. Those two books would be a good starting point for anyone, or I would even say a restarting point for anyone who's trying to jumpstart their faith. They feel like you've stagnated. Doesn't mean you're deep in sin. Maybe it just feels like, "Ah, I'm not sure what's going on with me and God right now. Start with the gospel of John and let your prayer be, God, ignite my faith with your word and watch what he does. Somebody else had a question, I think. Okay. Hi, I have a question uh, making a difference. Um, first of all, I want to say that I love my church. I love more life. I love the friends and family I've made here, and I love to serve. I serve about three weeks every month, but sometimes I feel like I'm missing out. I feel like I should have been here instead of back there. Mm. Or like a couple weeks ago, you did an altar call, an altar, sorry, altar call, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was with the toddlers. I was loving it back there with the toddlers, you know, praising with them and worshiping with them and playing with them but I felt like a big part of me missed out because I wasn't here. Mm. So how can I continue to feel myself while I'm still serving others? You have the answer for that one, a part of an answer. Yeah, you preach it all week, every week. <laughs> one, one, one in one. It's I a think, simple, it's, I think it's a straightforward. Beauty, I think the beauty of what we offer here currently is you can attend one and you can serve one, um, where we have, we have friends that have massive um, sanctuaries and because they have a massive san- sanctuary, they just offer one service. So that would be a practical thing if your time allows that you could um, attend one service and, and serve one service. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's definitely something that we even try to keep an eye on with our volunteers if they're, I saw Tucker was sitting up here and he's in the booth a lot. So, you know, we try to keep an eye on our teams that they're not, um, that they have something of overflow to give to others. So. Uh, No, I want to, I want to piggyback on that. Um, Can I challenge your thinking just a little bit? It's a bold, daring move to ask a question in public. And so I I want to ask you to change your thinking because other people are dealing with the thought that you have. And I think, it's, I think it's rooted a little bit in a misconception. When you serve anyone, especially kids, you're never missing out. We missed out because you weren't in here. Yeah. You didn't miss out. Um, and that is, that is, the other thing I would say is, God knew that you were going to be serving. He makes provision for that in all of his planning, yeah. Right? And that the people who serve, the proverb writer says this, he who refreshes or she who refreshes will be refreshed herself. You have a Bible promise that every time you give out, God has something waiting on you to give back to you. And so I don't feel like you should be at all under the impression that you missed out. I think that what I want you to take away is you did make a difference. The kids were blessed and God always comes through on his promise for you as well. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who serves so, so well. It makes, it makes a massive difference. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Did we, was there one, was there at least one more or are you all ready to go home and get your ham and whatever you're all going to eat? Was there one? I thought I saw one more. There's a, there's a, there's a lady clear here in the back, Matt, right clear in the back. 
Um, so this is kind of more of parenting and making a difference. Okay. We preach to our children that being a good person, even when it's not cool, is going to get you further in life. But what if they have um, a relationship with somebody that you know their morals and values aren't the same, but you also don't want them to tell them that they can't be their friend? How do you make sure that they stay on the right path and you know that they're doing the right thing? Good question. Will you tell me your name, please? I can't see you back there. I might know you, I might not. Erica Minton. Hi, Erica. Um, I can give a couple practical things on that. First thing, environments matter. And we made sure as long as it was within our power, our home was the main home that our kids and their friends used as their space for fun and interaction with their friends. Why? Because as parents, we had, we had a strong influence on the environment. We had a strong influence on the spiritual environment. We knew what was, for the most part, going on. And by the way, there will always be things that you think aren't happening in your house that probably are. And they'll tell you later at dinner when they're grown and you choke and like, what in the heck? I was asleep at the wheel on that. Um, <laughs> But that would be one thing. That's, uh -huh. That's upsetting. That is upsetting. <laughs> Our kids are old enough that we've had that happen. We've had that. Hey, we were, doing, that? we were doing this when that happened. I'm like, you yeah. son of a seahorse. Are you yeah. kidding me right now? I'm like, that happened on my watch. I yeah. was spiritual and attuned with what God was doing, yeah. which is an interesting side note because you're probably never as attuned to God's spirit as you would like to be because you're biased in that. Um, let me just say this. I'm not going to dodge the question. Um, if... If the expectation is that you are a perfect parent, your child doesn't need Jesus. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you have to be and try to be imperfect. We just are. But our imperfections leave doors for Jesus to get in the mix. Our blind spots allow Jesus to do the thing that we can't do. We never, now there might be other people, but today I guess it's us, we never tried to control or steer friendships. Here's what we would do. If there were people that we did not trust and didn't think had our kids' best interest at heart, we would have personal conversations with our kids. We would even have conversations with our kids as friends with our kids, saying, you did da-da-da-da-da. That's not okay. You do that again, we're going to have a problem. Now that might be a style that you're not comfortable with, but we felt the responsibility, and this is something that's important that I don't think has been said yet, that we feel the responsibility, and I hope you do too, we feel the responsibility to parent children we did not give birth to because they haven't had it. And we looked at it as an opportunity to be able to speak into those individuals' lives by living a life that was straight and narrow. Um, I think one thing that we can do is we can get caught up in our own spiritual journey and forget that there are young people who are coming along and watching us. And our belief has always been light is greater than darkness. God is greater than the circumstance and the evil influence. There have been times where this lady right here has prayed relationships out of our friends' this world. And I would encourage you to say that from time to time. Lord, I don't believe this, this relationship is in my child's best interest. Why don't you take them out of the equation? Get them out of the circle, which isn't, which isn't an excuse to not do the parental thing. For every parent whose heart has been broken, for every mom whose heart has been broken, with a child who's, who said, I hate you. I need you to know that on the other side of that, I hate you was really a thank you because you were parenting them in a way that they needed. And all they knew to express was anger because they hadn't developed to the point where they learned it was best to not always get their way. Um, there's a lot of layers to what you're asking me. And in the time provided, I think I could go on and on, but I think because of time, I think there's enough there to chew on. Would you agree, Erica? Is that, is that okay? 
I have a lot more I want to say, and I know Ange does too, but for the sake of time. Well, the other thing I was going to say is when we talk about parenting um, kids that you didn't give birth to, like I don't want to exclude the 60-year-olds. There's, there's people who are in their 40s that really need the wisdom that you can offer. There's people that are in their 80s that can give support to people in their 60s. So that doesn't end once we get older. There's always people who haven't walked that path that you're walking that really, really can benefit. I think about Don Martin, and I could cry, but having him, I know I can call him. Um, so just just keep on knowing that there's there's people that need you, and don't say, I don't have anything to offer. You know, if you're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, there's there's people in the previous generation that need your wisdom and need your support and need your love and, and prayer. So... It's good. <laughs> Here she's calling Don, and I'm trying to figure out how to get him to lose my number. <laughs> I love you, Don. Uh, I see one of my, so I see funny, one of my son's I, friends I, on the front row, so I'm like, please don't tell us. And there's stories that we don't know. Yes. And keep you guys are 25 now. That keep, happened. It, keep it yourself, Stephen. If it happened, they were 12. Just don't tell no, us. I don't, don't, I don't care. <laughs> Oh. You're welcome. It's really kind. Thank you. Y'all do okay this morning? Glad you came to church. If you're a guest with us, I promise you, this was not the worst church service you could have compelled to be at today if you were forced here with threat of harm or food. So thank you for enduring it if you did. Um, I want to say, uh, do, you, do you have anything else? Okay, um, I want to I want to say something before we go, if you, if you'll indulge me, that we didn't that we didn't get around to. Um, but I think it's worth saying before we leave that on this Mother's Day, um, I I I think we need to acknowledge something that very few people are giving language to, and that is the amount of gratitude that we should have. To, our, to moms based on this one thing, or ladies in general, but mom specific. Don't be upset at me, men, but it needs to be verbalized. Women change and sacrifice as a general rule way more than men. And this is not a men you stink moment. This is a reality of how incredible women are and how God's made them. Think about physiologically. Pre-child. During child. Post-child. Pre not being able to have children anymore. All the chemicals that change. The body that changes. I don't know if this is going to be appropriate or not, but I'm just going to say it. You... If, you, if your wife has stretch marks, you ought to see those as beauty marks because her body was ravaged to bring a human being into the world with half of your DNA. <laughs> Women change. Emotionally, they change. While I was getting up, getting ready, going to work and just doing the same thing every day for 20 years, my wife was giving intense management to an infant. Was there total su support and supply? Then they went to toddlers and then they're just like chasing and herding cats, just like free range humans. <laughs> to now they want to play sports and someone's got to get them to and from practice. Then they're going to go to a game. Then they're going to get married. Then they're, then they're going to get married and then they're going to maybe start having kids. And all the while the man's just eating dinner, getting in the car, or clocking in, clocking out, looking, doing their desk thing. And this incredible human being is silently navigating changes that she never verbalizes. And I need some people in this room to know how much change your mom, that dear female in your life, that spouse, has gone through and didn't mark it on a didn't mark it on a billboard, didn't rent a plane and have it fly in the sky, just silently 
day after day, week after week, walked her walk and did what she was assigned to do. And through the tears and the pain, she did it because there's a love that's so indescribable that she didn't, she didn't stay angry about it. We need to know that about the women that are in our circle, especially the men, because they're not telling us. So I've taken it upon myself to tell it, to try to give language to it. Women don't need men to give them a seat at the table. I'm not saying it for that reason, because the women I know, they don't need me to give them a seat at the table. They'll build their own freaking table. They don't need my help. But I am old-fashioned enough to believe it's still okay for a man to pull out a chair for a woman and open a door and close it for them and honor them and love them for who they are. So thank you. I love you. You're freaking crushing it. Let me read one verse of scripture because we've, we've had a lot throughout. Let me just quote one. It's the very last verse in the Old Testament before 400 years of silence. Here's what Malachi 4, 6 says. And don't be distracted by the word father on Mother's Day, but let me just give you the heart of it. This is the last thing God says before Jesus shows up. He says this, and he, God, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. I do not believe that this is only intended to be gender specific in this passage. I think he's talking about spiritual parenthood. One of the things I believe that I've said for years that I want our church to get really, really comfortable with is we as a people are going to have to get comfortable parenting children we did not give birth to. The crisis, the challenge that I see every day in what I do is the residue of people who've not had parental voices in their life. And I believe that God is going to use his church to restore the voice of a mom and a dad back to a generation who will then in turn be drawn to their heart, be raised up, go out and make a difference that's gonna last generations. And he wants to do that through you, his healed up people who will offer the grace and wisdom and life that you have to give to make an impact in the lives of those who are needing it the most.